Hi, this is Steven Seiler, and today I am kind of in transition to vacation modus. But before I go on vacation, uh, I wanted to have another chat with my daughter, who is still the only athlete that I coach from day to day. <laughs> She's the only one that'll have me. And I ask, actually, that's not true. But uh, she is the only person I'm I'm coaching from day to day, and uh, we had a chat. Uh, back in May after a race on the 17th of May, right? Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah, or after, after the half marathon, we discussed the half marathon and then the 10,000 meter and then, yeah, transitioning to 5,000 meter right. training. Right, and now you've done a 5K. So we're going to talk a little bit about the whole training picture. I, I tweeted a few things and there have been some questions about uh, the training process, the low intensity, the training zones and that. So we'll chat a little bit about that, but it's still a, a strange season. Uh, you know, we were just in the kitchen making coffee and talking about the difference between this season and last season. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, there's a lot less road races and very few long races, like half marathons, uh, with lots of people arranged. So it's basically only track races that are going on right now, um, and not that easy to find ten thousand meter races and like these longer races, more fifteen hundred and three thousand meter. Right. So. So you're getting some experience, getting on the track, got to race Bislett Stadium, the famous Bislett Stadium. You'll be racing in some other stadiums, going against some tough competition. But let's uh, let's start talking training, and, and I'm going to put up a few, uh, some visuals, uh, but we'll try to keep this a conversation. But those of you who can watch the video, you can also see some stuff on the screen. All right, so if this technology works, we're going to switch to the screen now. And I am going to put up a slide that is, I think, kind of cool because it is basically 18 months of your training uh, summarized in one slide. And I'm not going to go into, or I guess I can do and this. We're not in video now. Hmm? <laughs> no. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that we aren't on video now. <laughs> No, this is now we're in in screen capture mode. Okay. I mean, my dear daughter. Okay. Uh, so you can you know you can frown or whatever you want to do now. <laughs> Be embarrassed. <laughs> now we have to start the whole thing over. No, this is actually going to be just kind of off the cuff, and we're going to take it as we go. Uh, but what I wanted to do is show you this. See, now you got me all flustered. But anyway, so this is the first, this was 10 months from January to October yeah. of 2019. And then a break and a, and a start of a rebuild. And then we've had six months now in 2020. Six very different months, the first two or three, and then the last three. Mm. But if we go back a little bit, what's interesting is, is, April, May, June, 2019 yeah. versus April, May, June, 2020. Yeah. April, May, June, 2019, you, you know, if we go back to say December of 2019, you were, that was just starting to run again after a six month break. We've talked nine about this. Months. Yeah. Nine month break. So you got to remember, I was really fragile in January. I basically didn't there to even do any hard training at all. <laughs> yeah, Jan runs January yeah. 2019. Yeah. Let's just put the record straight. You were coming back from a nine month period where you had been at the start of that period really sick. Yeah. Uh, and I started, I was still pretty sick in December and I kind of had to build up my strength in January in every way. And so I guess maybe in March, April, I wanted to overcompensate a little bit for everything that I hadn't done in the right. last month. So I was kind of very eager to kind of get back to running yeah. hard and fast. Right. 
So. And, 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 but looking at 2019, January, February, March, it was going really well. You were mm-hmm. within yourself and yeah. you were, and we were basically using some zone three sessions as your heart sessions and then heart rate would kind of leak up. It would drift up, but that was what you were good for was, was Uh zone three. And then you got greedy. Yeah. And then in April, May, June, you start, and and this is, we've talked a little bit about this before April, May, June, 2019, or at least the first two months, April, May, those typical four times eight minute or five times eight minute sessions that mm. that I've done research on, I like, you like, they were just, you were just working them too hard. Yeah, but I do believe that my body was kind of not really in a very balanced state at that point because I, I was going from nothing to like running close to 100 kilometers per week, uh, which was kind of a big ramped jump up, yeah, ramped uh, from up too like fast. three months ago. So, so it went very well in January, February, March. Uh, but then at the end of March, we had, or that was maybe the beginning of April, we went for a training camp and I was at that point already pretty tired and also coming down with a flu. So when I trained in the heat, I kind of trained every session in one zone higher than what I was doing at home so I remember my easy runs were like up in 140, 150 heart rate which is like zone 3 for me Right. Uh, so it was just kind of a catastrophe (laughs) building up yeah and you don't handle heat very well and so it kind of just created this double jeopardy So, but we figured this out and by somewhere around mid June, and basically the solution became to put a on a on an engine they called a governor, but it was just a max. You just didn't get to go above ninety percent. At mm. least that was the goal, uh, and that helped solve things. Then you got you got your energy back and your your. Uh, you started just running more. <laughs> so yeah. that maybe was a bit of an overcompensation yeah. there. So I did go from too much high intensity to too much volume. <laughs> so I kind of learned the hard way in both areas yeah, at that so, point. <laughs> but you still managed yeah. to get it, get it kind of worked out. Yeah. And then and you had some good races in August, yeah. September, October. But when you got to October, you were yeah. tired. Yeah, I was very fatigued. I, my biggest issue, like even today, is just maintaining uh, my energy balance uh, and maintaining my strength in training and being, being able to train um, consistently, basically. So in October, I had like PR in September and... I was mentally pretty done racing for like a little while so then I kind of didn't have much more to give when it came to October uh, and I had a couple of races scheduled then but then I I dropped out of the one because I was just too too fatigued and too tired and I couldn't really push my heart rate up to max right. even. And school was kicking in in the sense yeah, that, you know, exams. you start moving towards exam period. So then I, I kind of asked you to do something that was pretty hard for almost any athlete. Mm-hmm. And I think particularly mm-hmm. hard for someone where running is kind of a, a what are you going to call it, a, a psychological control thing. And, and so I said, we're not going to run in November. You're not going to run in November. You're basically going to not run. How hard yeah. was that? Um well, I guess for because running for me is or training it's always been like a form of meditation almost uh, kind of working through mental issues and like bad moods, good moods and it kind of just it's almost like brushing my teeth I guess it's it's like a routine you kind of get you feel uh, normal and when that's just taken away and you don't get to really run at all something feels just very missing but i did know that it was definitely needed so 
I didn't try to sneak in runs, but it was difficult to kind of coming off a, a long season with lots of running and the highs from races and then suddenly just having to rest and recover. <laughs> it's not that awesome, <laughs> really, no. but it's important and I've learned that. Really. Yeah, and I don't think you would have been able to do what you're doing now and, and no. be healthy and running well if you had not done that. No, absolutely not. And, and we learned, we also took our cue from a, some runners or some athletes in Norway where, you know, not necessarily because they had any kind of energy issues, but just they tried to skip that one month layoff that a lot of athletes take that where they really back it down after a hard season. Uh, and they tried to skip it and then they end up not being able to really reach peak performance yeah. the entire next season. And they end up saying, well, the only difference between the good season the year before and the not good season the year after was that I dropped that recovery period. Yeah. So that was my argumentation is you've got to recover. You've got to get on the plus side mentally and physically and mm -hmm. kind of reset yeah. your brain also because your brain gets very used like you're saying to these routines and that can be a Absolutely. bit dangerous yeah. for you so anyway so that's what you did in, in november when it says rest you really did rest you didn't do much of anything useful no, physically I, yeah just yeah really didn't do much some elliptical and, and i also got an injury like all of a sudden it was in my hip like uh, just a uh, yeah uh, I had to have a cortisone injection actually because I wasn't able to walk properly. So that was maybe a good thing because then I really wasn't able to run. Right. <laughs> but so what I believe is that uh, since it was really my first or this last year has really been my first entire year as a runner, I guess, from January 2019 to, to now a little bit over a year. But so I kind of, I, I've had to learn as I went and that rest in November, I do believe that this year it will be a lot easier because I know the purpose of it and that it will only do me good. So I don't think I will be as stressed about not running, not right. training, uh, because I do believe that that rest period and then the strength build period in December, January, that was ultimately what uh, enabled me to really, really push hard and reach a big peak for the half marathon in March. Like looking back, it, it's almost like I was a different athlete in, in October, 2019 and then March, 2020. Like I felt like I really did climb the mm. ladder, <laughs> my personal ladder. Yeah. But now you trust that rest is not dangerous. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and that you respond pretty quickly to training yeah. uh, and, and that's an individual issue but you you have to trust the process so that gets us to March and that's where we were talking last time you did the half marathon had a good half marathon and then corona hits and all those plans went down <laughs> yeah out the, out down the toilet but yeah. slowly things are coming back but they're coming back in a kind of a very piecemeal way in the sense that the only races that are coming back are maybe the most elite level races it, yes. and that's kind of scary isn't yeah, it i guess oh. unfortunately we aren't there aren't too many women runners in norway really competing at high levels i guess compared to the men uh, like now the 5,000 meter we were I think 14 girls or women uh, compared to like 130 men right. or so uh, and so there's a big difference and you kind of like standing on that line you kind of face the the fastest girls like here in Norway and so it definitely for me is, is very exciting uh, to be able to to run against some very fast girls and also just learn what it's like to run in a pack and so it was my first 5000 meter and also uh, my first real track race against other <laughs> women so everything is kind of coming at the same time but I think it's exciting to 
So I'm just glad we're able to race at all, even. Yeah. <laughs> well, before we move back, just so we, because I put this out on Twitter the other day, yeah. and um, it's it really is very similar to what you would see from an elite rower, runner, cross country skier. I mean, the picture is very similar in terms of the green being the dominant color, the low intensity. But if we kind of put some numbers to that and go in and say, well, what are your zones? That's what they, I pulled these straight off of Polar Flow, which is what you happen to use. And uh, so when you're in zone one, now we don't think of zone one as recovery training for one thing. I don't really view running as recovery. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I basically uh, my or I might do a recovery run in the sense maybe after a race, like after the five k, I, I ran ten k very easy the day after before traveling home from Oslo. <laughs> That's like the closest I get to a recovery run. But otherwise, I try to just run good easy runs with a bit of length to get that aerobic training in so i guess the point we're making here is that even when you're running in zone one your typical length of your runs is what about 16k yeah something like that uh Mm -hmm. so it's a bit over an hour it's about it's between 75 and 90 minutes typically but then before a hard session i might drop down volume just to have a bit fresher legs right but you can run at 4.45 kilometer pace, something like that, on flat road at least, yeah. and be at a heart rate of 115, right? 120. Uh, maybe, yeah, 120, 115 is a bit lower. 120, yeah. Yeah, 120, 125, like, yeah. when I'm... So clearly in zone one. Yeah. Uh, Zone two, we never, I don't think we really ever prescribe. I never say, I want you in zone two today. No. We basically, <laughs> your, your training prescriptions are really simple. They're yeah. either easy, which means just getting out there and running in that green area, or pretty much hard, which yeah. means it's some kind of a high intensity session, but those differ. Yeah, very, depending on what I'm training for. So, Obviously, for the 5K, it was <laughs> quite a bit of zone 5, right. but shorter intervals. So, not as overall like demanding sessions on the legs and overall energy, but at the same time, they do take a lot to and time to recover from. So, it's, it's interesting to learn the difference between, say, 5 by 1K at 5K pace uh, or like six by two K half marathon pace. Like right. the last session is a bit easier for me, I feel like. Yeah, well you in general handle volume well. Yeah. You handle threshold and below intensity well. And then you hand you know, but but as the intensity goes up and the speed goes up, it's it's tougher on you to recover from and that's mm-hmm. something we've learned. Uh, but if we're looking at this scale on the screen now, most of your hardish sessions are in that zone four yeah. area. So, and, and, and I'm just showing this to show that whether you're a world-class, world record holding runner like Ingrid Christensen or an aspiring young runner like Sierra and Amelia Seiler, <laughs> the basic training looks very similar in terms of uh, intensity distribution. This is data from all the training diaries of uh, Inga Christensen, that Espen Tunnison, uh, this was one of the subjects he had in his PhD work years ago. And this is just a season f- that she actually set uh, a world record. But you see that lots of green training, and even in the competition period, June, July, August, when she's on the track doing 5,000 meter and 10,000 meter, she's still doing mostly low intensity work. But when she's going hard, she's going quite hard. You know, and, 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 and that's kind of where you're at now, too, is that getting ready for, ready for some of these hard races, that, that's where you have to turn up the heat a bit. Yeah. Uh, but it's tricky because you have to also recover from it. It is. 
And so, the, you know, this is a typical prescription. We talked a little bit last time when we were together about how you've gone to these nine day cycles. Yeah. And that's still working for you. Mm-hmm. Kind of guarantees some rest. So that's on the screen now. People can see what a half marathon prep looked like for you back in uh, February. And, and this is the basic, it doesn't look that different today, but what is different when you're preparing for a 10K or a 5K, and then maybe in August you're going to try to do a 3,000, is just like Lego pieces, what we plug into those hard sessions. Mm. Um, so, so if we show uh, right now, this is, what you're, this is where you're at right now. Mm. Um, we, let's see, the 29th on the left of the screen was the Bizlet 5000. That was one week, that was uh, five days ago, six days ago. Where are we now? Saturday, the 4th. So we are here, and this is where you were on Monday, the 29th. You ran at Bizlet. In the evening, so yeah. Yeah, at 9 o'clock at night. <laughs> Did a 1649. That was your first official 5K, but so it's a personal best. <laughs> uh, and then easy, easy, easy. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's pretty much what the weeks look like or the cycles look like. But then we got to Friday, which was yesterday. Yeah. I joined you on the track. Yep. The prescription was to kind of bring it back to kind of 10K pace. Yeah. 10k feel i i mean or it's it's definitely a mental thing you just have to set your head on a pace and then yeah go by feel but so the 10k i i am a bit more confident with in terms of pacing um but definitely pretty hard coming off a very hard 5000 and then and, and the three days easy, the first day was obviously just a 10K easy, but then the next couple of days were between 16 and 18. So still have quite a bit of kilometers in my legs, but, but I'm typically good at handling volume. Uh, but at the same time, it was hard going into a 10K session yesterday. I was probably not fully recovered, but still able to do the session pretty much as planned. So. Yeah, and I joined you on the track, and I had prescribed this, the 3K, 3K, 2K, 2K. It ended up being a two-minute recovery is what we ended up using. It's just you yeah. you, you got two minutes between each each one, and it was passive recovery. There was no jogging. Um, and we dropped the four times 300 at the end. Or we forgot. <laughs> <laughs> but you weren't supposed to say that. It was supposed to sound like we made a very intelligent decision. Yeah. Uh, okay, we forgot. Uh, but actually, I do think it ended up being an okay thing because you were still tired. Yeah, and typically I don't really forget anything in sessions. I would rather add. So That's true. I truly did not remember or feel like it was really necessary yesterday. Yeah, so yeah. if you forget something, I think maybe that's your brain yeah. secretly trying to uh, protect you <laughs> from yourself. I, I'm not sure how that works when it's the same brain. But but anyway, uh, but, and you ran them at, uh, basically, if you add it all up, the, the, that adds up to 10,000 meters. And you did it almost exactly 35 minutes, I think maybe 35.05. Your PR is 34.55. So, you know, it was it was a decent session, but... I think you worked probably a bit harder than you would have on fresh legs. Yeah. Is or that fair? Fresh engine, I would, I would say. Yeah. Resting heart rate. You know, what do we use to look at your recovery? You look at your resting heart rate. Uh, I do, or I have, in the past, looked at my rest heart rate a um, couple of mornings, like after a hard session or. Uh, a couple of days before a new hard session to kind of just calibrate myself and it's worked uh, it makes sense because my heart rate rest will typically be a, maybe five beats higher uh, after a hard session the day after and then drop down again within one to two days uh, so when it's like all nice and low I know I'm recovered uh, so 
it's a good indicator for the day before a heart session at least then you can go into it and know that you're you're recovered your heart is recovered <laughs> that's well, how i think of i'm it. not sure it's the heart that's actually recovered but you're at least the autonomic balance is your back your yeah. back kind of re- get a reset and, and and it gives you confidence to know that you're kind of whatever was pushing that heart rate up is is recovered so i have my heart or my legs that i need to make sure it's recovered <laughs> between <laughs> yeah. i'm not a, a like a sports scientist I just no, but but you have your way and i think that's important to think about is that you know i look at some things you look at you feel things yeah. you feel how your body's working <laughs> so you know my numbers plus your your feel. feeling is if we if we actually listen to both and calibrate both then we end up doing okay yeah. it, at least now we are after a, quite a lot of learning about how your body works oh. so that's that's basically it you you see on a monday you're going to do a long run now we're out of that 7 day rhythm so the typical sunday long run doesn't always end up on a sunday anymore uh, but you've gotten gotten used to that um, yeah I think the maybe the downside is running with other people. Yeah, it is a little bit difficult to maybe schedule running with other people, but at the same time, it's not too many people here around that I am able to run with because there's not so many girls running. Um, but I have trained with a, with some guys, but they are at another level than me also. So yeah. It's a bit hard, but uh, but it's okay and make it work. And I do like to do uh, sessions alone too. But I'm also loving company when I can. <laughs> <laughs> but you're kind of in the you're yeah. in a I think a lot of good female athletes, particularly endurance athletes or athletes that are doing solo sports, yeah. are in this situation. Maybe not just in Norway but where you kind of fall between two chairs, as they say, or two stools, they say in Norway, um, because you're, you're better than most of the, the females and there's just not that many to run with. And then the guys either don't want to run with you because you're too fast <laughs> or they are too fast yeah. because they're elite. They're... And, and so, so you kind of really, it's tricky. Uh, to get that group feeling and and it, and it seems like you you were talking about how after the 5,000 meter mm. that the girls at Bislett you guys were all or you were all chatting and like talking about different things and it was really nice to kind of feel that uh, group or belonging in a way like just having other girls there um, so it's a shame that there's not like a bigger environment for it, like here in Norway at least. Uh, it's very focused in some parts of the country. Mm. Uh, like and, and we don't have yeah. university sport. We don't no. have that kind of thing. If you, you would be maybe a senior at a university in, in the United States and you'd be running for a university team with it its advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. But here you're kind of on your own. Um, very much so yes <laughs> so so we talked about maybe even inviting some of those girls down doing a trying to do some kind yeah, of a, that would be, a that weekend would be very fun. yeah so anyway we'll see but that's that's just part of the life of a, an endurance athlete sometimes especially in small places small countries uh that you don't always have just a whole bunch of training partners yeah. waiting now, if we go forward a week, because uh, you're going to do another race now in basically, a, uh, what, where are we now? A week or a little bit more than a week, a about more, 10 days. Um, you're going to do another 10,000 meter. It's shown up on the schedule. And again, we're in that situation where it's all or nothing. You're either, there are no races or it's a potential kind of elite field. Yeah. Yeah, right now there are not many people entered the race, so hopefully there will be some more women. Yeah, <laughs> if so not, it will be maybe a mixed field. I just hope I can run. <laughs> in the well, race. so you threw this at me and you said, "Papa, I need a, I need a plan." Yeah. Uh, and the, so if 
I, I was told about this basically on Monday or Tuesday this week, the, the 30th, and you said, I'm racing again in 15 days. Uh, give me a plan. So this is, this is the plan. That's how sophisticated they are. This is what I put together and sent to you. I even put little pictures on yeah. to make it more sophisticated. <laughs> but there's not a whole lot of sophistication in the sense that when we say easy, we don't see that as recovery. That's training. But it's below your lactate threshold. It's, it's you know, uh, in that green zone that we talk about. And then we want to make sure that the sessions that you do uh, n right now are kind of specific to the pace. So we do pace specific work where you're adding up the, bo the, the, the segments towards approximately the race time. Yeah. So it's not complicated, but it's hard work. Yeah, you have to be uh, ready for those sessions because they are definitely not zone four. They are zone four or five. Yeah, they, um, they drift up. They do. For sure. And the only other little, ch you know, your longest long runs because you're very, f you love long runs and uh, you've done 30 kilometer long runs. Yeah. But we've, that's another little break we put on and said, look, during this phase, we don't want that to be too energy sapping. So, so yeah. I kind of tried to keep you down around 2022. Yeah. So it's basically the same kind of training as before my 5,000, um, just a little bit shorter long run, but I still like to keep it in and yeah, some strides on the easy days and still keeping the strength work in uh, but just making sure i don't do anything that will really make my legs super sore the day before a hard session and so just kind of listening to the body and kind of going a bit day by day but still following a plan uh, but i think it's very important to listen to the body in these very specific preparation periods so i might uh, adjust and do for example a long run a day before and then easy or a rest day the day after uh, to have one more easy day between uh, the race pace session and the booster session like this is things i think it's important to kind of go a bit uh, along by the way feel, right. by feel. so the plan is is that in a few days you'll do a, a, a final kind of a hard you know a full hard session which is a, the classic 10 times 1000 meter yes uh at something around race pace maybe even a, you know that's a that's an aggressive race pace 34 that's 30 for you would be a new race PR. Pace. right <laughs> so, so we'll see what, whether that's what you end up being able to do but but we're not afraid to kind of think in terms of of progression but then this is the tricky part is making sure that you recover into the race and generally we've kind of built this little taper pro program and you call it, I think you gave it the name booster session, and it's basically yeah. a half interval session. So you, the goal is to turn on the engine, get some race pace, speed work, or, you know, uh, efforts, but leave the track knowing you could do a lot more. Yeah, it's, I also feel like it's a bit of an energy release. Like, you don't want to go super easy too many days before a race then your energy or your nervous um it's kind of your nervousness builds up and you get more anxious and then it's just a good a little booster i guess just boosting the engine and then yeah, and get a little bit down. tired so you yeah. yeah you you have to manage your head as well and, <laughs> and, and the other thing is then we have a standard kind of a, a cut down on the volume that you do a 12k which is you know that's for you dropping it from typically 16 to 12 and then 12 to 8 and then race so, and that kind of recipe has worked pretty well for you so we just yes. just repeat it you know it's not any magical thing no uh, yeah it i i do like to do it that way i before half marathon i've liked to have three days easy or a drop down of three easy days instead of just two because then I feel it's more important to really taper the energy levels as well in terms of fueling, basically. Right. And really feeling like your glycogen is pretty, pretty, pretty full. full. Yeah, I like to feel uh, 
full, yeah. <laughs> or not full in my stomach, but full in my muscles. Right. Yeah, so the half marathon issue, what's going to limit you is different than 5K, 10K. And yeah. 5K, 10K, you want to kind of tune your, almost like tuning your nervous system. Your, yeah, a little, yeah, a little sure. bit, your, your, the kind of the, in Norway, in Norwegian, they call it spinnings, the, yeah. the, the nervous energy level and, and kind of get that at the right level because you're going to be anxious, yeah. <laughs> but you need to be able to control it. Yeah. So some running actually helps you to just kind of control the nerves. Yeah, I uh, definitely running helps me <laughs> mentally to control my, my nerves and a little bit of stress and anxiety i always get a little bit extra anxious before like races or events or places where i want to do well or uh, perform so but i think that's pretty general for most people you do want to get nervous because it does help you with the adrenaline and just you can't get too nervous because then that will just detract energy instead of give you extra yeah, and I guess one good thing about this season with these races, with these talented, you know, the, the, the higher level girls and on the track and the famous business, you kind of say, well, okay, I belong here and I can do this. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you said that to me after the race as I proved to myself I, I belong here. Yeah, I, I definitely didn't say that the days before <laughs> because then I was kind of second guessing myself and feeling a bit, yeah, like a small fish in a big pond or ocean an ocean actually you know and <laughs> uh, but it's just about you have to do it the first time to be able to feel more confident in the future so one time has to be the first anyway so i just kind of told myself when i was there that i was ready and that i was supposed to be there and that i was prepared and then it went well so yeah. just got to believe in yourself basically and, and behind the scenes, you know, you've got a coach and a dad, but you also have some other people that are slowly, you're kind of, you've been good at building yourself a little bit of a support team. You, you're part of a running club, but, but that club, I don't think you, you don't do a whole lot of activities with them. Uh, but you have a physiotherapist uh, who we're seeing a picture of here. Uh, you have someone who does some acupuncture work yeah. for you. Yeah. And then the most recent has been a chiropractor. Yes. I was uh, specific, specifically for my neck, an old neck injury from when I was dancing or actually doing gymnastics. And I tried to do a double uh, flip. Yeah. I don't know what it's called, but I. Salto. Salto, yeah. yes. Um, where I landed a bit wrong with my knee in my head and then got a concussion and uh, my neck kind of I think got a big smash at that point so it's been a bit bad ever since it that yeah, was how tense. old were you then I was maybe 15 yeah, or so. so seven years ago and that's mm -hmm. one of these things that injuries like that just kind of can haunt you uh, I have some of the same kind of injuries that just they don't they don't disappear mm -hmm. but so so you've got that chronic issue and, and and some acupuncture and now chiropractic has helped but this in this case this was uh the physiotherapist that works with the regional kind of talent development program here at the Olympia Tolpen Center and she did a nice job she had you come in and first she did some filming on the running and then some specific exercises just to kind of look at your um, weakness areas. Yeah, and your strength. posture during running, your and and, and so forth. So, uh, like here are some of the exercises she you, she had you do, and she was just very carefully analyzing. I think all of this looked pretty good. And I got to say, you you're very you know you don't look very strong because you're not exactly a muscle. <laughs> muscle warrior but but you you're pound for pound and you know you've yeah, got good strength strength and you used to always kick butt in school when the physical education teacher you know you did different tests and all that stuff so like the picture in the middle are these so-called pistol squats and and I think you've done what 15 K 15 kilos in mine, your hands yeah mine my uh, record is 20 kilos <laughs> but uh, yeah Right now, I think I can do 15. Yeah. Um, 
being a runner, you kind of have to work on your strength if uh, it's not like you don't, you yeah, you have to maintain it. So I was maybe a bit stronger, like maximum strength when I was dancing. Maybe. Right. But yeah, I mean, because you're doing it, you know, it is, and we know there's some issues related to what we call concurrent training, doing strength training and endurance training at the same time. But for you, it's really important, important to, to and, and we generally think that part of your, if you're going to have a chance to be more competitive at a higher level in 5K, 10K, then you've actually got to be even stronger in your hips and, you know, where that speed is generated. So... Um, we're very aware of all that and, and I think basically she was pretty pleased with what she saw because yeah. uh, you've got good overall strength. She did detect one kind of issue with one leg a little uh, bit. I'm basically just uh, tighter in my left uh, hip flexor um, um, so that may make it a little bit of a uh, an, an even Stride sometimes because yeah, yeah. um, I'm a bit I'm stronger in my right leg that comes from that was my my main like jumping leg when I was dancing um so I do definitely have one stronger side but I guess most people do but yeah. so that's just something I've been more aware of lately stretching more both sides really making sure I stretch my hip flexors and glutes like regularly right. And, and uh, we'll see if this works because this is a video, a couple of videos. Uh, she had you do this exercise. You have to remind me what the goal here was. <laughs> um, I do think it was to stretch uh, and to, I had to keep my, my lower back on the, on the Yeah, keep so, it from arching. Yes, yeah, right, so right. on the mat, so kind of a combined strength and uh, stretch exercise and just lowering the leg as far as I could without lifting up my lower back. Without pelvic rotation, yep. right. Okay, and then the other one, now this is kind of interesting because you, <laughs> we talked a little bit last time about how Paula Radcliffe, you had, you had studied her autobiography <laughs> and her training and so forth. I'm a and big fan. You're a big, <laughs> let's, yeah, let's just, you know, no name dropping, but you're a big fan. Uh, but in, along those readings, you found a passage related to a test that she did, a jumping test. Can you yeah, describe that? Yeah, or basically she uh, talks about how she uh, didn't have that final kick at the end of races. Uh, her competitors would outrun her the final lap so she wasn't able to close in the same speed as they were and uh, it had to do with her um, power um, or power force yeah just her yeah. explosiveness or leg stiffness yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so they uh, developed some exercises like plyometric exercises and also a jump test where she had to jump onto a 40 centimeter box uh, 20 times as fast as possible. And it said that her uh, competitors, like the main Sonia O'Sullivan and a couple others, they could do that test in about 16 seconds. And the first time she tried, she did it in 27 seconds or something. So that kind of... Um, made her realize that that was a an area she really had to work on that power and speed and uh, explosive mm -hmm. area so um i kind of incorporated a bunch of plyometrics into my my 5000 meter build up too because i know that's also a place where i'm definitely i have a weakness uh, i'm not a fast twitch fiber person by nature so so working on some uh, small jumps and really trying to do small movements but very quickly mm -hmm. like this uh, video shows yeah, we um, can look at the whoops um, we can look at the video this is this is what the physio had you do now this is a single leg lateral test so it's different from what Paula did Paula was jumping with two legs up and down on a box 
but same kind of principle is just quick contact and whoop, lost right. balance. Mm -hmm. But short ground contact and trying to really use that uh, ankle uh, or <laughs> ankle and uh, calf stiffness, leg stiffness. Yeah, I yeah. think that's very important. So um, training a lot to kind of really get your Achilles and the, those small muscle around uh, your feet like really stiff and kind of mm. popping or snapping. I don't snappy, know. Yeah. yeah, snappy. So it's a long term project now, and I have to you. you I gotta say you you kind of gave me an important correction a few weeks ago, and that was that you know I've kind of said well you don't own a fast twitch fiber in your body and <laughs> you know and, and and you have amazing strength endurance you can you've done i think years ago when you were 15 you could probably do i think it was 32 minutes you sat in the 90 degree wall sit position we had to stop because we yeah, had a reset the teacher made you stop <laughs> so you have tremendous strength endurance but not this natural speed and i've kind of I think I kind of, you know, went too far in kind of saying that that is your situation, that's your weakness. And at some point you sent me a text message and said, well, I don't like that narrative or I want to change that narrative. I can't just say I'm weak and, and give up on it. I have to, you know, I have to change the story. And I think that was pretty important. And I, and I had to, I've, since then I said, okay, yeah, you're right. You know, I, I don't think you're ever going to be a 1500 meter specialist no. but it was an important thing to think about is just the way we describe ourselves the messages that we give ourselves the way I describe you that can be self-defeating yeah and uh, you gave me a correction there and so I'm making it a point to not you know not say that you are eternally slow <laughs> or eternally you know that you're <laughs> that you only own slow twitch fibers but we're we're seeking those fast twitch fibers that are there yeah. and we're going to awake them yeah they just need some some work <laughs> specific work and and even within a, a few weeks uh because i do think that training for shorter distances is a bit more complicated or complex i guess because you have to have more elements you can't just do volume and and uh, aerobic capacity building work you kind of have to do the the strength and the plyometrics and the small things that kind of awaken the mm. <laughs> all the muscle groups i guess you don't want to be fatigued going into a hard session and that's the number one thing I've had to learn in this 5,000 build-up because when I was training for the half marathon, you kind of got used to running big, hard workouts on a bit tired legs. And that was okay because that was kind of just preparing me for the half marathon and making me stronger uh, as long as I was able to do the work and recover from it. But, but doing a 5k those sessions were definitely tougher uh on the muscles mm. and uh, so they really need to be more snappy <laughs> that's the word we started using yeah and I, i'm gonna just to show if i can get the calendar going here before we finish up I'm depending on the internet working double time here. Uh, is it going to work? Yes. So the, the, the thing I wanted to show is that when you run or in any athlete, when they run a, a race like a 5K or a 10K, basically in that distance, if they're fairly good, they will progress towards maximum heart rate uh which is a very different scenario than a marathon or and so forth because then it's more like you were saying it's body management whereas a 5k is you know it is basically you're it's trying to find the right speed where you're going to cross the finish line at max you yeah. are at maximum heart rate maximum probably very close to your vo2 max and so forth 
So if we pull this up, now the speeds are not correct because... Uh, the GPS is totally wrong on the track. I wish they were. You'd be one fat... I'm, I'm going to just take that away. And But here, I'm just going to show... That's, the, that's your heart rate during the race. Um, and you were essentially at your maximum heart rate half the race and pretty darn close for 85 percent of the race <laughs> so you know 89 percent of the race was officially in so-called zone five but if you look at that you basically flatline uh by the third kilometer uh and so so this is the reality it's tough it is a uh, limit effort and and that's part of the reason why these do take a while to come back from yeah and I I always I wrote to myself I had basically I never really write the time goal for myself because I feel you can't really put limits on yourself you just want to go hard and give it your all so I just wrote give everything I've got and try to uh, close with a kick and my kick is still not the fastest kick but I was able to do a little faster last lap at least but I was definitely at my um, max uh, capacity towards the end there so we started a, a bit fast uh, the two first K we were at maybe we were at like 16.30 pace um, so I tried to hang on to a group uh, but I, I figured that I had to kind of lay a let them back go. and let them go because I knew that that was too fast for me right now um, but it was just a learning experience and it is definitely a lot easier to hang on to a back of a person than running solo so that was mainly why I wanted to try to run behind someone but then uh, most of the race ended up being a solo race and then mm. yeah so i do think with a perfect pacing strategy uh, maybe you could have done a little bit uh, a little bit faster but just a couple seconds maybe yeah but, uh, so i it's don't not think there, there were too difference. many more seconds in the tank here Definitely because when not. i look at this heart rate i know you were given your all uh, but I actually made a little audio file 13 days before the race, and I, I, I predicted 1645 to 1655 as the range that I thought you were capable of. And you went 1649, so that was pretty darn good uh, prediction. And it was just based on two things. It was based on your 10K time mm -hmm. and the research, you know, the world record, the world leading performances that we showed before about you know what percentage of 10k speed are they at for 5k and you were basically just right on that that regression line and then the other thing you look at is we always kind of I look at how those uh, those hard sessions about 14 days out how, how they're going yeah. uh, I used to think it would be about six about a week out or eight days but for you you know you kind of hit your stride and you're ready to race and you kind of you're not going to get faster and that happens about two weeks out wouldn't you say from a race because i i like to um i think it's a little bit um risky to do a kind of peak session only a week out if it's uh, if it's like a very demanding session but if it's controlled then it's okay but if it's like for example we did a 1600 1200 1800 400 session a couple of weeks out from the 5000 which was my main peak workout where i kind of got confidence um so uh, we're looking at your your little yeah. log book here um yeah so that was the 20th which was nine days out yeah uh, so that was kind of the last one you did that was you know and, and then I, you were sharp you know you you were all your speeds were under 5k pace the other just for people who are curious you know like key workouts you did in that last in the in june building up to this was uh 
you did 18 times 400 uh, yeah. on the uh, 7th of June. That was about three weeks out. And those were all, they were like in 75, 76 seconds. Um, then you th put on some track shoes for the last three, and, and they were in 73, 71, 75. You did a five, th let's see, a five times 1,200. Uh, you did a five times 2,000 on the 16th. So everything was pretty tough. It was, you know, it was uh, 5K pace or faster. Yeah. Uh, and, and now you've got, uh, as we finish up here, you, you're going to do this 10K race. It kind of came up a little bit suddenly, and now you got to kind of ride the wave because you've been working pretty hard. Yeah, so my idea was uh, that I wanted to do <laughs> this 10,000 meter race because of the build up for the 5,000, which has been very good, and also this race itself. So it's about just riding the waves. <laughs> Yeah, how yeah. To, to but we're not it. sure, you know, because you're you're not used, you're no, not developed sure. enough that you're used to doing races with a high frequency. No, you know, so like a world co a world class athlete might be doing races every, you know, seven to fourteen days during and I'm the season. Not a world class athlete. <laughs> well, and you've got you've had issues with energy, you yeah. know, and also we're still developing. So this is part of the process for you is to say, can I? Can I learn how to manage my body and be able to hit pretty darn close to another peak just 14 days later after yeah. such a big race? And, 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 and this is going to happen several times now in the coming uh, month or two where you're yeah, going to do... the coming fall season at least. Yeah, like but you've got a race in, two races in August and then September. Yeah. And so just about every two or three weeks is another big race. Yeah. Uh, so that doesn't really, you can't really do a, a kind of peaking process. You've kind of got to uh, be pretty consistent. You've yeah. got to try to find a rhythm and it's got to be sustainable if yeah. we're going to make it to September. Yeah. So, so we don't know how this is going to go. No. Um, but, but the goal, the biggest goal is to get through a full season, another full season, healthy. Yeah. Right. Uh, mentally balanced and ha happy. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, but really mentally and physically balanced and healthy and happy. <laughs> and yeah, so I am definitely just I'm working to get better at running, but I'm also just working at uh, being able to live as a what can you say like as a an endurance runner just making sure i take care of the important things such as eating and resting and yeah not falling into a hole after every race for example right. so it's just like these maybe almost like uh, beginner things but at the same time it's i think many people might we all do really with it. Yeah. and and yeah. so it's definitely tough but you can only get better at it by practicing and experiencing so yeah i just think it's fun to kind of learn and and race and do well sometimes <laughs> so yeah so that's where you're at uh you know we're seeking sustainability what i guess is the 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 phrase you might use and, and we're achieving you're achieving sustainability you had some you know three pbs in three attempts this first half of the year now you go into maybe the, the goals for the next few months or more racing and not necessarily time trialing in a yeah, sense definitely not every race that would be pretty mentally tough to yeah. PR in every race. Right. <laughs> so so, no, so we'll see how it goes. Um, you'll get to race some good people and you got to rub shoulders with the Inga Britsons and the <laughs> at Bislet and the, it's kind of cool. Uh, so, so anyway, so that's where we're at. Uh, and maybe we'll have to have another chat in September or October and see how it all went. Huh? Yeah. Does that sound good? For sure. If not before. <laughs> all right all right well let's let's uh have a good summer then I, i'm going on vacation you have to run <laughs>